studying the Bible. The Bible gives life. Man can only give you his own philosophy. And it will not work. How we respect men who have acquired a lot of money and uh, gotten a lot of fame and forget what really matters. True life is not in things. Are you hearing me? True life is not in things. And it's not in being famous. The world may applaud you when you do what they like. But you do something they do not approve of. They'll hate you for it. Look at Jesus. He never sought to please men. But he's still the greatest man that ever came to this planet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Does Jesus inspire you? Build your life on Jesus and his living word. Don't build your life on some philosopher. Praise God. Well, we've been on a beautiful series from the words of Jesus when he said, anything is possible. That's what we've been sharing on. Anything is possible. You believe it? That's what Jesus said. Anything is possible. Hallelujah. Anything is possible. Anything. Anything? Sure. So Matthew's Gospel chapter 17 one more time and I want to read from verse 19. The disciples of Jesus found out they couldn't do something they wanted to do. They tried everything they knew. They said what they heard Jesus say. They did what they saw him do and yet it didn't work. So they came to Jesus in the 19th verse of the 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The Bible says, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? In other words, why couldn't we do it? Why didn't it work? We said what you said. We did what you did. Why didn't it work? It's the same story today. Lots of people are asking questions. Well, you know, we prayed about it, but the man still died. We prayed about it and we still lost that job. We prayed and we lost the baby. We prayed. We prayed. We lost the money. We prayed and that still happened. Why? So I said, well, I can't understand it. I did everything I know. <laughs> Why don't you for a moment just discipline your mind and remember there's probably something you don't know. So they came to Jesus. Because when Jesus fixed it, they realized that what Jesus said, they had said. What Jesus did, they had done. So they said, Master, why couldn't we cast him out? Why couldn't we do it? And the 20th verse, Jesus, without means and words, gave them the right answer. He just hit the nail right on the head. Verse 20, Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. When it comes to dealing with God, nothing is too late. You have to make up your mind about it. Nothing is too late when it comes to dealing with God. Somebody said, well, you know, our uncle, we were praying for him not to die, and then he died. I can understand it. I prayed, and I had a prophecy, and God said he will not die. And But then the man died. I really feel bad about it. All right, remember Jesus. What about him? They came to Jesus in the 11 chapters in John's Gospel. They said, Master, he whom thou lovest is sick, Lazarus by name. And Jesus said, all right, um, I'll be there. Well, Jesus waited too long. 
and the man died. And Jesus said, this sickness, he told him, he said, don't worry, I'll be right there. This sickness is not unto death. God will be glorified. In other words, the man will not die. And they were happy. And they went back home. They said, he ain't gonna die. But they were watching him and he was going slowly. Miriam and Mary were there. They said, no, he will not die. We got to Jesus. He said, he will not die. And Jesus said, he's coming. Well, the guy was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And then he died. And the two ladies felt terrible. Oh no, it's impossible. Where is Jesus? And he hadn't come. Oh no, no. But Jesus said, he will not die. He said, the sickness was not unto death. But, oh God, why? Why? Can you imagine what the situation would have been in that home that day with Mary and Martha who had known Jesus so well? And Jesus said to them, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. They must have become confused. How could he have said that? He had never lied to anybody. Is he a false prophet? What is all this? There they were confused. Number one, he didn't show up. He said he was coming and he didn't come. Number two, he said, it's not unto death. And the man died. Well, they buried him. Four days after the man was buried, here comes Jesus. He gets to the gate of the city and they tell Mary and the sister matter, Jesus is here. Mm Mm-hmm. Really? Anyway, Master, If you had been here according to your word, my brother wouldn't have died. And remember, the Bible tells us both Mary and Mother said exactly the same thing when they got to Jesus. And they got the one before the other. Why? Because they had been talking about it. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, yeah, your brother shall rise again. Yeah, I know that. He's going to hand me that stuff. I know. On the last day at the resurrection, Moses talked about it. Every prophet has said it. Yeah, on the last day. No, Jesus said, come on. I am the resurrection and the life. If a man would believe in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In other words, when it comes to dealing with me, nothing is ever too late. Why? Because I am the resurrection and the life. He said, if you believe in me and die, you'd live again. He said, if you believe in me and you leave, you always leave. In other words, whether dead or living makes no difference. I am the resurrection and the life. Then he said, so where did you put him? He said, he's in the cave over there. He said, take me there. And Jesus went with them. When they got there, the crowd, they said, how he loved him. Because Jesus looked, and then the Bible tells us he wept. Tears came out of his eyes. We've all tried to answer that question, why did Jesus weep? I'm not sure I know. I've already given so many answers through the years to my mind. But I really wonder why. That's one of the questions I'm going to ask him when we get there. Alright? So save your breath. I can ask him for you when we get there. (laughs) 
You know I'm so close to him. And, and just in case while we're there, you don't want to go talk to him, I'll talk to him for you. <laughs> Would you like to have that? You would rather talk to him yourself? Yes. Then keep the question. When you get there, we'll all ask him, all right? Hallelujah. Jesus wept. Then he turned aside. And he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me because you hear me always. I never cease to be inspired by Jesus. And on this particular occasion, he did something most remarkable. He stood outside that cave, the entrance of that cave, and called Lazarus like he would call any living person. And told him what to do like he would tell any living person. He said, Lazarus, come out like he would tell someone inside a room to come out. He said nothing about death. He didn't say rise from the dead. He didn't rebuke death. He just said, Lazarus, come out. And the guy that was dead came out hopping, bound in great clothes. And then he said to others, lose him and let him go. And that was all. And Jesus walked away. Oh. You read it and you think about it. How did Jesus, why did he do it that way? How you know the prophets have done several things, you know, like the prophets lying over the dead and raising the dead arm? Or you read that about Elijah, Elisha? And um, you read about Peter, you know, praying by the side. And he did something close to Jesus. He said, Lady, get up, you know. But yes, Jesus doesn't go into the cave, stands right outside that cave, and he calls the man out. Tell somebody, nothing is ever too late. Can you see it? So, here we are. And uh, we've been praying, we didn't want that thing to happen, and it happened. And now we're wondering, dear God, why? Dear God, why? It's not too late. Stop asking why. You can still do something about it. Don't come and ask why. Why? Anything is possible. You've got to come to that point in your life where you believe the words of Jesus. He said, anything. Say that word, anything. Say it again, anything, anything, anything is possible. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. You're a victor. That's what he made you. You know, like some people, they say, oh, she's been feeling stomach pain and the family is getting concerned. This stomach pain you've been com complaining about, why don't you go for a test? Well, she's gone for a test and they said, somebody said it was one thing and the other one said it's another thing. And they said, all right, but she's still complaining. No medication has worked. All right, let's take her abroad. So they take her to New York City. And she gets there and they check her and they come up. Oh, it's cancer. What happens? The whole family goes, oh. Why? To them, the sentence of death has been passed. Well, they fly her back and they try to give her the best treatment possible because she's going to die anyway. So, they've already asked the doctor, how long does she have? Because cancer is a killer. So, how long does she have? Well, um, six months at best. And sometimes they say, well, two years, depending on how far it's gone. So, they say, well, maximum six months this time. Oh, oh, oh. So, they bring her down and they get here. Well, you know she's got cancer and... Um, Everybody starts preparing for her death. Why? It's too late. Why didn't you tell us about this stomach pain from the beginning? If you had told us from the beginning, we probably would have been able to do something. Maybe we would have cut it out. What is all that? Why didn't you say something? 
Why is everybody complaining and getting angry? Because in their minds, it's too late. Nothing is ever too late. As I tell somebody, nothing is ever too late. Nothing. Not with God. He says, I will restore your wasted years. He says, that which the canker worm and the parlor worm have eaten, I will restore. <laughs> he said to Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham said, at my age. God said, relax. You'll see it. He said, Sarah, you're going to have a son. She laughed. <laughs> God said, why did you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. God said, but you laughed. He said, you're going to see it. You will have a son. Yes, sir. 75 years old, me. Hmm. You know what some people think? Well, I'm 43 now. Is it ever possible for me to have a child anymore? Hmm. Menstruation is not even regular anymore. I say it once in five months now. They say menopause will set in at about this time. Listen, and listen hard. Mrs. Abraham, Sarah by name, didn't have no menstruation. He was completely gone. Are you hearing me? He was gone. Gone. <laughs> See, yeah, that was Sarah. But the Bible says God has no respecter of persons. What he does for one, he will do for everyone under the same circumstances. In other words, if you believe in him, a child of God cannot be barren. Don't you understand? You will get pregnant the day you believe in him. You say, I believe. If you believe, then talk like you do. Hallelujah. Somebody said, oh, I wish it was really like this. Oh, it sounds so good just to hear it. All right, tell Jesus he's lying, all right? Tell him he's lying. Don't fight with me. Tell Jesus he's lying. Tell him. <laughs> How many of you have faith in God? Come on. Mm -mm. You have absolute faith in in God, that God does not lie. You got ab absolute faith in God? You trust God? Yes. All right. Then you have to trust this book. Because by the same principle I told you, if you have faith in God, like Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, he said, have faith in God. All right. Then the margin says, have the faith of God. All right? Good. So, if you're going to have faith in God, or have the faith of God, now, God and His Word are one. You ought to have faith in the Word. You ought to have the faith of the Word. Nothing is too late. Amen? Do you hear me say nothing is too late? Good. Nothing is too late. Anything is possible. Praise God. Now we'll look at, you know, a few principles in the Word of God. You know, many people don't have a problem believing that God can do anything. They believe God can. But we're not dealing with God can at this point. Because we all know God can. Even the unbeliever believes God can. <laughs> you understand? The ages believe God can. They all believe there's a God. Even though they try to make it like there's no God. 
When something happens, he says, oh God, but he's an atheist. I heard a man one time, he said, um, uh, well, he actually died and went into darkness. But by the mercy of God, God brought him back to life. And he said something. He had been an atheist until he got to the deathbed. And he said, it's easy to be an atheist when you're successful and everything is going all right. He said, but when you are dying, it's very difficult to be an atheist. I think that's true. Praise God. So there are principles to live by. And Jesus, Jesus said here, in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 17, verse 20. Can we read it? Are you ready? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, can you see it? You don't need so much faith to get it done. He says, all you need is your little faith. And when you have that little faith, you can build it. How do you get the little faith, the original little faith? It comes by hearing the word of God. If you're born again, the Bible says you already have that measure of faith that God gives to every believer. Amen. So it says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say, hey, come on, say that word, say. say. One more time, say. say. Look at it now. He says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall what? Say. You shall say unto God. Ah. Uh, if ye have faith, ye shall pray. Look at it. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall cry. You know, some people cry, Oh God, have mercy upon me. Oh God, please, 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 no, please, please, please. Whatever I've done, please. Take this problem away from me. Take it away. Take it away. And God ain't taking nothing out because He didn't put anything there. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall, ye shall. Did God say, I shall? Come on, Jesus said that. Did Jesus say, I shall? Did he say, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, I shall say? No, he said, if ye have faith, ye shall say. 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 Say, say, say unto this mountain. Remove, remove hands to yonder place. In other words, get out of here. And it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. I like it. That lets me know I can change anything. Doesn't matter what you were born with. You can change anything. Are you still here? I said you can change anything. You can. Don't look at me like that. You can. Hallelujah. You can change anything. 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 He says, you shall say unto this mountain. He didn't say you shall say unto this devil. Why? He's given something. He's telling you, now there's a mountain there. Now, this mountain represents anything that hinders, anything that's in your way. Can you see it? It could be a devil, it could be anything, a pain, a frustration, whatever it is. Just name it. You don't want it, tell it to leave. You shall say unto this mountain, remove hands to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Jesus said that and he proved it. Today, you are the architect of your life. Lots of people don't understand that, they don't believe it, but it doesn't change it. 
The life you're living today is the picture of what you planned and said yesterday. Somebody said, well, this was not my plan five years ago, but this was your talk five years ago. Your talk is your future. Oh, you didn't hear that. I said, your talk is your future. Your tongue is the director of your life. Hey, come on. We read it the other day when we studied from the book of James. And we found out how that he said that the tongue is like the captain of the ship. Where your tongue goes, you go. If your tongue is confusing, you are confusing. We read about Job. I believe it was two Sundays ago. Is that right? We said about Job and how that God was not the one who was trying Job. God was not the one who brought evil to Job's life. We found out from the scriptures how Job brought it to pass. It wasn't God. Ordinary surface reading would seem to show us that Job was tested by God. And God just didn't care about his children and God just destroyed everybody. It wasn't God, it was the devil. And who was responsible for it? It was Job who was responsible. The devil couldn't do it until Job broke the hedge. Because God didn't break the hedge. We saw that in the Bible. We saw that though Job was a righteous man, we studied in the Bible, don't forget, you get the tapes. We found out that though Job was a righteous man, a wonderful man, and God even praised him, we found out that he lived in fear and unbelief. Job used to say, I'm not safe. Have you heard people say, when, when there's a noise, maybe something is breaking, there's a noise, say, are we safe? You know, some people, they talk, no, there are just some people I can't run with. I, I mean what I'm talking about. I, I just can't, I just can't, you know, I, I can't, I can't, you know, <laughs> I can't be with them. Not for long. They are so carnal. Boy, I'm not talking about, I'm not dealing with robbers and, 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 and idolaters. I'm not talking about, no, just normal, nice Christian guys, some of them are terribly carnal. I mean, they'll destroy your faith. There's a noise. Are we safe? <laughs> then you say something to you say, Is that what we will eat? You know, this is so carnal. And then they wonder why their lives are ups and downs. You have to distance yourself from such people. And if you're like that, you've got to change. Otherwise, five years' time, you will be something else. You'll be amazed. What you are now, now, is what you said a few years ago. In other words, what you said yesterday is what you are today. You are the picture of your life, what you said yesterday. Your words make you, or your words break you. Are you hearing me? The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Did you ever hear of our friend Job? Job was a wonderful man of God. And I'm not talking about human thinking, the human standard. God testified of Job that he was an upright man, a righteous man. That's what God said about him. Job was a great man. His faith was tried. His faith was tested. And thank God, he was not found wanting. Amen? Well, there's something about the life of Job that has confused a lot of people. They say, but why did God do that to Job? Someone said, does God still do such things today? You know, when they go through some problems, they want to know, maybe they are like Job. Maybe they are the Job of the 21st century. Maybe God's trying to play the same trick on them that he did on Job. They lost their job. Maybe even lost their children. They've gotten so sick and dying. 
All their friends have abandoned them. The spouse is gone. So they say, maybe this is from God. I might just be another Job. And then you remember the famous words of Job. Naked came out of my mother's womb. The Lord has given. <laughs> and the Lord hmm, has taken away. Can, can we read? Can, can we read? All right. Maybe for those of you who are not quite acquainted with what Job went through. May I just read to you very quickly? What you went through. The book of Job, chapter number 1. And if you don't know where the book of Job is, turn to the table of contents. <laughs> hmm. Chapter 1. From verse 1, there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and escaped evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He had ten children. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east did you hear that the richest man in all the east in those days was an upright man a man of god man that loved god perfect in the things of god so don't you think that the more you serve the devil the richer you become it's a lie it's a lie of the devil. Somebody says, if you serve God, you might just become poor. You serve the devil, serve the devil first and get rich. And then later on you can serve God. <laughs> the devil doesn't make people rich. Far from it. He lies to them. He says, but what about the rich people who don't serve God? I'll tell you who gave it to them. First, ask yourself, what about the poor people who don't serve God too? If the devil gave to those people, why doesn't he give to the other poor guys who don't serve God? Proof positive, it was not the devil that gave it to them. Had they get it in? They stumbled upon or acted rightly on principles in this world that God has already given. Brothers and sisters, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, if you will sow a seed of corn in the ground, it will sprout, it will grow. Because the law has been given there. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, if you walk off of the balcony, you will drop down to the ground. Why? Because the law of gravity is in operation. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God. You still there? There are principles of success laid out in this world. That if any man will take them and act upon them, he'll become successful. The only trouble is, the principles of this life are under a curse. Which means, if any man will rely on the principles of this life for success, he can only go up to come down. Why? Because it's all under a curse. Which means, it cannot give you permanent success. Oh boy, if you miss that, take a pillow and start sleeping. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Alright, don't sleep yet because a better one is still coming, okay? A better one, don't miss the next one. Okay, now, follow this. Where are we? Verse, verse 1. Okay, I'm not, I, I won't need to read verse 4. I want to go straight to verse 6. All right. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Now, since the sons of God, if you study properly, you understand he was talking about angels. They had an angelic conference with Almighty God. So the term sons of God there doesn't mean sons of God in the, in the, um, in the saints of the New Testament. No, it refers to angels at this time. Alright? 
Because you look at the Hebrew word used there, you'd know he's dealing with angelic beings. So he says, Satan came also among them. And the Lord, verse 7, the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now, somebody says, You mean Satan came into the presence of Almighty God, and God didn't destroy him? Yes, the Bible says he did. So why didn't God destroy him? Because God could not. Why? God could not. So when God called for a conference, Satan came. Before then, listen, before Satan could, Satan couldn't. Uh, and row for LMC. Just the background. You remember Satan was one of the archangels long ways ago. That's a, you remember? Long, long, long. How many of you were there? All right, you suddenly weren't there. Okay. But many, 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 many years ago, many before Adam was created. So, Satan, at that time, he was not called Satan. He was not a devil. He was an archangel. He was called a covering cherub. All right? Long ago. And then, of course, you know, something happened. Um, he was lifted up in his heart with pride. We can talk about that another time in details. But the, 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 the revelation given to us in God's word was that God sent him packing. All right? He was thrown out of God's presence for doing the wrong thing. And when he was kicked out, he never again attempted God's presence. Then God said, let us make man in our image. And God did. And in our likeness, he said. And God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. You remember the creation of Adam. And later on came the, the creation of Eve. All right? Okay. So, we had Adam and Eve. And in the Bible, Jesus says that God put them in the garden. And then Satan, Satan could not even come into the garden. Do you remember that? He couldn't come into the garden. He wanted to, but he couldn't. So he figured out, what am I going to do? So, he looked out for someone that had the right to come in. The Bible says the serpent, you can study for yourself in Genesis chapter number 1 and chapter number 2 and chapter number 3. So, he looked out for one who had a right to come into the garden, and that was the serpent. Now, the serpent used to have four legs. He was not a snake. Are you getting it? The serpent, the Bible says, was one of the cattle. And he was very cunning. Very smart. Smart thinking. Not negatively. But positively. And so the devil looked out and he said, Well, I can get into this one. The serpent was not a human person. So he could be influenced. And so Satan got into the serpent. And came into the garden and spoke to Eve and deceived Eve. I could preach for a whole month on that line only. In other words, there's so much in there. But just follow me to where we're going, all right? And of course, the Bible tells us that Adam was right there when Eve was deceived, and that Adam was not deceived. Adam knew the truth. And he sold out to the devil, obeyed the devil, did what God said not to do, disobeyed God and obeyed the devil. 
And when he yielded himself to the words of Satan, he placed himself under the authority of Satan, who was ministering to him through the serpent. And Adam was cursed. Really, Adam was not cursed. It's a strange thing. When you study it in the Bible, you discover God cursed the serpent and cursed the ground. He really didn't curse Adam and Eve. Strange. Hallelujah. Something about it because he had already warned them of what will happen. What God did was to pronounce the results of their sin. Now look at it. If I say, don't get out of that room. Or if I, if I tell you, yeah, don't get out of that room. Because you get out of that room... You get into trouble. And then I tell you the kind of trouble. If you get out of the room and you get into trouble, is that a curse? It wasn't a curse. They got out of the room. God already told them there will be trouble. And they got out and got the result of that disobedience. So he asked Adam, he said, what have you done? And he said, oh, the woman that you gave me. And, and God said to the woman, why did you do this? And the woman said, well, the serpent deceived me. Did God ask the serpent any question? No question. He just cursed him. He said, now, upon your belly shall you go. You are cursed. And then God said, looking at Adam, he said, cursed is the ground for your sake. God didn't curse Adam. He didn't curse Adam. He said, cursed is the ground for your sake. God cursed the ground. Instead, he said, you're going to have to sweat to get something out of it. He said, you're going to have to labor to ever prosper. You, for what you've done, you. He said, it will produce thorns and thistles to you. Out of your sweat shall you eat bread. Until you return to dust. For dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. That's what God said. And some people misunderstand that, and then they say the grave is the end point. There is no hell, and there is no heaven. No, the same God who said that, said there is a heaven. And he said there is a hell. And he has told us that man is a spirit. It's his physical body that returns to dust. Because the creation of man and the formation of man are two different things. Man was created and man was formed. The inward man was created by God. But the outward man was formed from the dust of the ground. The outward man is the man that you see, that's sitting down. The one, the body and his senses. But the inward man is the human spirit and his soul. You get it? How many of you have understood that? Can I see your hand up? All right. Now look at this. When Adam became a, a servant of the devil by yielding himself to the devil, Satan gained the authority over Adam. He gained Adamic authority. And with that Adamic authority, he became the God of this world. He became the God of this world. Are you hearing me? And that's why when Jesus came, Satan said, Now, you can fall down and worship me and I'll give you everything. He said, Look at all the kingdoms of this world. And the Bible says he showed them to Jesus in a moment of time. He said, If you will fall down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. Because they have been delivered into my hands. Now, if that had not been a bona fide temptation, Jesus would have never had to say it is written. Because Jesus would know, Well, he's a lying. That's not true at all. But you see, it's been delivered into his hands. He actually stole them. He actually got them from Adam. You see that? So, he said, if you will fall down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. And Jesus wouldn't fall for that. 
Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, later on we understand that Jesus defeated the devil. Amen. Oh, we can talk about that. But at this time in the Old Testament, Job, living in the Old Testament, you remember, I said, God called for this angelic conference, and Adam came, uh, uh, Satan came. How come Satan could present himself in the presence of God and not be kicked out? Because he came with Adamic authority. He didn't come with his fallen angelic authority. He had lost that, but he gained a higher authority than angels. Have you gotten it now? Because Adam's authority, even though he was in the earth, was higher than the angels. And so when Satan got that authority from Adam, he was able to come into the presence of God. Now, he cannot do that again. Why? Because Jesus has defeated him. So he cannot go into the presence of God and begin to talk about you. He can accuse you from here. But he don't come to heaven. He's been kicked out, defeated. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. All right. Now, look at this. Verse 7. Job chapter 1. Are you still with me? Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and through in earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escaped evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast not thou made an edge about him and about his house? An edge of protection. He said, does Job fear you for nothing? Haven't you built an edge around him and around his house? And about all that he had on every side? How did, how did Satan know he had been there? He had been there. He had tried to go take away from Job. He had tried to attack him. But he found out there was a hedge about Job. He tried to destroy his business. He found out the business was protected. He tried to destroy the house. The whole house was protected. And he was so frustrated until he found himself in the presence of God. And God said, have you found out about Job? And he said, yeah, the man serving you, of course, because you have... You protected everything he's got. You protected his life. You, you, look, you, you've taken good care of the man. Look at it. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. Look at look, Satan is talking. When a man is blessed, it's not the devil. Even Satan knows it's God who blesses. Look at it right there. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Then he said, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. He said, you touch what is God and see what happens. Did God do it? I said, Satan told God, you touch what you have given to Job, to Job and see what happens. He will curse you to your face. I said, did God do it? How many of you agree God didn't do it? Put down your hands. How many of you agree God did it? I can see just a few hands here. Where are some hands? Okay, put up your hands. If you think God did it, did God do it? There's a hand up there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? You believe God, God touched what he had? Did God? Did God? Did God? Okay. Okay. Okay, you're not quite, some of you are not sure. How many of you are not sure? You're really not sure. How many of you are not sure? Okay, I'm only going to tell those who are not sure. So, if you're already sure, we can close the service now. <laughs> Since we already know. Praise God. All right. Wonderful. 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 Verse 11. 
Satan still talking. He says, But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he had, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he had is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now watch the works of Satan. I want you to watch. This is just something else. I want you to watch. Here is Job enjoying himself and his family. Everything is all right. And Satan comes on the scene. Now when Satan shows up in your house, look, verse 13, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Your servants are dead. While he was yet speaking, while this servant was speaking, because he was the only one who was able to escape, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. And had burned up the sheep. You remember the number of sheep we read about? His oxen and so on. All right. He says, The fire of God is falling from heaven. And had burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Why he was yet speaking. This is the first one. There came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Listen, in one day all of his business went down. His children died all at once. In one day. How did when Satan can come in, there's no telling how far he would go. You cannot beg Satan. You don't say, please, please, I'm so bad enough, please. No! Until you are dead, he is not satisfied. He will take your children. He will take your wife. He will get on your case. Wreck your business. Get on. Listen, don't, don't make friendship with the devil. He doesn't play cool. That dude is evil. Completely evil. Just, just, just look. This is terrible. Verse 20. Now imagine, look at Job. And he's hearing all this stuff. You expect him to be celebrating? <laughs> Then Job arose and tore his mantle, that's his overcoat, and shaved his head. He removed all his hair. He shaved his head completely and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Oh God. <laughs> and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the good Lord had taken away. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's about one of the most inspiring attitudes in God's eternal world. You are hearing some of the most challenging statements ever to come out of the lips of a man who suffered such crisis. The Bible says he fell down. He had shaved his head and he worshipped God. What an attitude. I mean, you read that and you, you, you just sit down and cry. 
A man like you. A man like you. He didn't say, what is all this? What am I going to do? No. Am I the only one? He didn't say that. Think about it. How many of you have gone through this? You've gone through this kind of a thing. In one day. How many of you? Has this happened to you? In one day. Paul says, why this man was still talking? The other guy arrived. Waiting to give his own. As he was saying his own, the other man arrived. Until the last one came and said, even the children, all of them, all ten children are gone. They are gone. Mrs. Job. Think about it. Don't you think she will go, she will lose her mind at this time? She's already old. How is she going to have children again? Ten, ten of them. They have grown up enough to enjoy themselves in their eldest brother's house. So they're no longer children. They've grown up. The business is gone. All the children are dead in one day. Just one sweep, uh, all gone. I want you all to read what he said in verse 21. Want to go? No, 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 verse 21. Hallelujah. Good attitude. Say it. Say, say that with me. Good attitude. Good attitude. Say it again. Good attitude. Good attitude. One more time. Good attitude. Good attitude. Everybody outside, say good attitude. good attitude. No, those of you outside, outside the hall, say good attitude. Yes. Good attitude. Look at verse 22. The Bible says, read it, want to go. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He wouldn't utter nonsense against God. He had the right attitude. Because he honored God in his life. Look at the next chapter. From verse 1, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it, because I have no at home address. And, and the Lord said, <laughs> Relax. Well, that's implied, isn't it? All right, verse 2. Why would anybody move like that? And God always wants to know where he's coming from. And he has no address. And the Lord, verse 2, and the Lord said unto Satan, well, no, 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 we're through with that. Verse 3, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escaped evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest, I want you to see that word and underline it. Thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Have you seen that? Thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Lift your hands to what heaven. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Say it again, thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, sometimes you wonder, apart from sin, what else could bring 
sickness to a Christian? What else could bring failure to a Christian? What else, apart from sin? Get, most of them Christians don't have a problem with sin. It's not sin that's the problem. The problem is the mouth. And in fact, the sin problem that they have is the tongue problem that they have already. That's what gets them back in the bondage with sin. I'm tired of these children. They will kill me. Oh. You are a gunner. I'm telling you. They will kill me. They will. You'll see it. Soon enough, you'll be carrying your heart in your hand. Why? Because you said it. Nobody cursed you. You are the... No, some people... Somebody, you know, <laughs> I heard about a man, you know, he was in a meeting like this, listening... And then the preacher was explaining to them how that they were responsible for some of the, you know, in fact, all the wrong things that were happening in their lives. And the guy got up and walked out. And they asked him, hey, why? Why are you going? He said, I don't agree with that preacher. He's trying to blame us for everything. <laughs> you see, he would rather lay the blame on God. You see that? He can't understand why such things should happen. They want to say, God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. We can't tell how God's going to move. Well, God might bless you today. You know some people, they say, don't be overconfident because today may be your day and tomorrow may not be there. So be careful. Every day is not Christmas, they say. And when they get happy one day, have you ever heard them? They just wake up and they're happy. They say, ah. Why am I so happy today? Ah, I hope this is not a sign of bad omen. They try to get themselves, you know, they say if you're too happy at the beginning of the day, it might end badly. Where, where did you get all this stuff from? Where? I don't have any friend, I don't have anybody, I don't know. When I want to talk to somebody, there's nobody to talk to. I don't know. Why are you looking for somebody to talk to? He never told you to talk to somebody. He said, talk to God. Always looking for somebody to talk to. I need somebody to talk to. And not somebody you want to talk to. He got a problem. And he's looking for somebody to talk to. And you're wanting to talk to him. Why he, he will put you in the same mess that he is in. I really, I think I really need to talk to somebody. I really, I really, really, really. <laughs> Go! When they are through with you, they would have shaved your head. <laughs> Just go. What is he going to tell you? His own experience of life. The Bible says, the old, the aged, are not always wise. Wisdom doesn't come from age and experience. Wisdom comes from the anointing. Spirit of God. And in that realm, there's no guesswork. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen? Why would a man grow and grow and grow and move forward and then suddenly make a detour in life and things just begin to... Go downward. Why? Why is it so for many? They think it's the government. It's not the government. No, it's not the government. I'm not saying that the government shouldn't be held responsible. No, 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 no. Hold the government responsible for its responsibilities. But you see, when it comes to your personal life, the government of any nation should not dictate your prosperity, your joy, your happiness, and your success. Are you hearing me? Because success has no country. Oh, I wish you got that! It's got no country! Hold yourself responsible. You say, okay, for example now, I was fired at work two years ago. I didn't know I would be fired. 
I did everything I could do. I did everything which, that was right in that company. And then they still fired me. How could I be responsible? Yes. You are now responsible for what is happening to you now. The confusion you are in now is now the trouble. It's not the problem. Hear me. It's not what meets you that is the problem. It's what you do with what meets you in the face. Hey, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. In other words, it's not your experience that is the problem. It's what you do with your experience. All right, you've been fired. What do you do? Where do you go from here? Do you look upward or do you look downward? Now you've been fired. Do you think it's all over? Are you going to move better? Are you going to get greater? It's up to you. Where you go from here is what matters. Are you going to go home and have people come to you and, Oh, we're so sorry. We never knew it was going to happen. We feel so terrible about it. We feel so bad. Well, never that. Are they going to be talking to you as they're trying to help you and sympathize with you is that what you want the Bible says after Lot was separated from Abraham God spoke to Abraham and Lot had taken the best part of the field and left the bad one for Abraham But after he was separated from him, God spoke to him. He said, Abraham, now look to the north and to the south, to the east and the west. As far as your eyes can see, I've given it to you. Are you going to think like Abraham? Are you going to go back and say, where do I start from? I worked for this company 45 years. Where am I going to start from? What is all this? I can't understand it. Such is life. Look at me now. I'm going down. You are seeing yourself going down and down you will go. Some of you, I wish I met you five years ago. You wouldn't be where you are now. If you had heard some of these things five years ago, don't worry. You still got time. At least you're hearing it now. You can do something with it now. Hallelujah. You still can. It's not too late. The problem is not the capital. All the capital you need is inside you, brother. You think you need some multinationals to send you money to try to get you up. No, that's not what you need. Everything you need is inside you. I found that out a long time ago. When you take an orange seed and you put it in your hand, you don't have to do anything to that seed for it to have roots, for it to have its stem, for it to have its branches, its leaves, and to produce other fruits with many, many seeds in them. You don't have to do anything but sow that little seed in the right place, in the soil. That's all you have to do. You don't have to add anything to it. Every potential that it requires to produce everything it's got to produce is inside that seed. Everything you need to become the you that God has brought you into this world to be is inside you. Oh. I can never fail. It's impossible. I cannot be poor. I cannot. I just can't. You say, ah, the guy's boasting. No. No. No, I'm boasting in God's word. I found out God's word works. And I've gotten a hold of it. I found out it works. It works. Glory to God, it works. So I'm boasting about the word. I found out it works. This thing works. It's alive. The Bible says the Word of God is living and active. The Logos of God. God's revelation from the Word. He says it's living and active. It works. If you put it inside you, it will make you a master of the circumstances of life. You will never live in fear anymore. 
You will not be in defeat anymore. Problem with men is they don't know how to work the word of God. Put it inside you. There's no telling how far you go. All the limitations will be taken off of your life. Your potentialities will be let loose on planet earth. I know who I am. I've found my place. I've found my roots. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Get a hold of God's word. Are you hearing me? You know, when God made you, he had a plan for your life. Get this. He's the potter. You are the clay. How many of you understand that? God's the potter and you are the clay. You think he fashioned you mistakenly? You think God doesn't know you're here? I love it. When you study the Bible and book of Acts and God, you know, Jesus speaking to Ananias and telling him about Saul of Tarsus, he gave him his name and gave him the right address. He said, I want you to go lay your hands on a man named Saul of Tarsus. He's down in a street called Straight. God knows where you live. He knows your name. He's got all the details about you. Jesus said, not a strand of hair from your head falls without your father taking record of it. You don't even have the record. But he does. He knows everything about you. So he had a plan for your life. Some people live to become what God planned for them to be. Some never get there. Some never get there. Getting there is your affair. God has everything ready to get you to be the man that he wants you to be. But there's no guarantee that you will be outside the word of God. Spirit of God told me something a few days ago. He said, many men struggle in vain in life. And they will. Because God has determined what each of us should be. Everything outside his will is a struggle in vain. If only men would know how to look to God and say, what is your dream for my life? And catch that dream and move in direction of that dream and come out tops as far as that dream is concerned. Because in the world there are no two fingerprints alike. No man can ever do it just like you. No man can ever be like you. You're unique. Nobody, nobody can fulfill that dream just like you. So when you know that dream that God has for you, go for it. And when you go for it, cut no corners. Get to the limits. Become God's dream. Hallelujah. And while you're going, help others get to their dream. That's life. Help others get there. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hey, okay, can a lawyer come out here? A lawyer that goes to court, okay? Okay, the, you also come, come. That's a man and that's a lady. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh -huh. Take your Bible. You have to have your Bible. You need a Bible. Okay. Now, you look at that Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 8.
Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. Tell me, what does it sound like? What do you see there? The microphone is coming to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. Tell me, is it a proposal? Is it an idea? Is God sharing a vision? Read it and then tell me what it is. Okay. Praise the Lord. He that digeth a pit shall fall into it, and whosoever brigades an edge, the serpent shall bite him. What is that to you? I, I say law. I say law. I say law and a statement of fact. Lawyer? It's a law. Are, it's a law. It's a law. So it's a spiritual law. Brothers and sisters, it's so important that we understand God's word. Listen, that is a spiritual law. He said, he that breaketh an edge, a serpent shall bite him. It's not a promise. It's a law of the spirit. Good. Now that hedge around Job, Satan could not go through it. If Satan had been able to go through it, he would have done it. He couldn't. So he told God, you put a hedge there, and no one can go through it. That's the reason that guy is prosper. Number two, God would have to violate that principle if he broke the hedge. He should become the victim. He said, he, he said, who's so? Is that right? Anyone. Anyone who does it, a serpent shall bite him. Now, if it's a spiritual law, it means that he is not dealing with a physical serpent. He is dealing with the enemy. Who is to become the victim? The one in the house or the one that breaks the hedge? Who is to be the victim? Talk to me. Okay. Now there was a hedge. Satan could not go through until that hedge was broken. If we don't know who broke the hedge, let us find out who was bitten of the serpent. You see that? Find out who was bitten of the serpent. The guy who was bitten of the serpent, the Bible says, is the one who broke the hedge. The serpent there is the devil. Old Testament revelation of Satan is the serpent. And in the book of Revelation, Satan is called that old serpent, the devil. So when Satan came and got to Job, it was because Job already broke the hedge. How did he break the hedge? That you can begin to see. You will see why. Why Th that problem is inside your bones. You will see why. You understand that the fact that the doctor said that you were born SS. And so you must suffer from sickle cell anemia. You will see that it is not the doctor's report that is your problem. Your crisis are your making. No, you think that people should be sorry for you. Oh, oh, it will not change your situation. The cancer in your body is not your grandmother's button. Because God put a hedge around you. If you serve God, He has a hedge around you. You say, the robbers broke into your house, they destroyed this, they destroyed that. What about the hedge? What happened to the hedge? Brothers and sisters, the day you were born again, you were fenced around. Glory to God. How can that fence be removed? 
I don't have much time now. But I'll just rush through this. If you read through the book of Proverbs, he will let you know, with your mouth you tear down a house. He said, with your words you can tear down the walls. And these are not talking about physical walls. It's talking about the walls of your life. The hedge around you. You tear it down. Tear down the wall with your own mouth. How did Job successfully carry out this terrible, nefarious activity against himself? I'll show it to you. Turn there. Book of Job chapter 3. You will see it now. What does the Bible say about fear? This fear has what? Torment. Fear has torment. And who is the tormentor? Satan. You don't understand. Fear has torment. And the tormentor, the Bible says, is Satan. And if fear has Satan in it, it means fear opens the door to Satan. You're not born with fear. Fear, is, fear does not live in you. Fear is an outside force that you can welcome into your life. And brother, if you welcome fear into your life, you have welcomed, welcomed the torment of Satan into your life. Don't say, I don't know how he got into my family. You brought him in. Fear is a door. It's Satan's door. It's his chief door. Alright, let's read from here. Chapter, chapter 3, book of Job. And I am reading from verse 20. When Job suffered all these things, he began to say from verse 20, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery? And life unto the bitter in soul, who, which long for death, but it cometh not. The man wanted to die. Die. See, he, he, just, he was fed up of life. His business was down. His family was gone. His wife left him. Everything was down. And Job said, why am I still living? What is all this? What am I living for? You know, it's painful when you have been a big man. You know, when you've had everything. You've had all those official cars and all those drivers, you know, doing everything for you. And then all of a sudden you have to stop the boss. You know what that means. Life just, and those who used to respect you, now look at you narrowly. Like, who is this? You feel like killing yourself. All right? Job was in this situation. To worsen it, his whole family was gone. Those who thought he was somebody, who thought he was serving God, were now asking him, where is your God? You call yourself a man of God. Where is your God? Those of us that don't even believe in God, we are enjoying more than yourself. And look at him. Suffering. And he says, why am I still living? Look at it. Verse 21. Which long for dead, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures, which rejoices exceedingly, and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid, and whom God hath hedged in? He said, God has hedged me in. Was it God who did it? He said, He had set darkness in my path. He has faced me that I cannot pass. He said, God, had, God has blocked my way. That's what he said. Verse 24. For my sign cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. Verse 25 shows you the key. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. Uh oh. Can you see it now? This shows us the life that that righteous man was living. He was a righteous man. He loved God, but he lived in fear. Can you see it now? See why you can be, you can be such a wonderful man, a great man of God. When terrible things begin to happen in your life, people will not know. Because they are not acquainted with spiritual laws. They will not know why such things happen. They said that man of God was traveling. Suddenly there was a ghastly motor accident and he died. I don't believe a man of God should die by accident like that. No. It's not right. Does that mean he was not a man of God? No! Great man of God! But that was not the right way to die. Look at Elisha. The Bible says he stood in the place of Elijah. He had tremendous experiences with God. Great miracles followed. The Bible says Elisha became sick. He was so sick. 
that he died sick. And he was buried. The anointing was still in his bones. When a dead man was laid in his sepulcher, the Bible says when that dead man's body touched Elisha's bones, he came back to life. Why with all that anointing did Elisha die the death that he died? Ask yourself those questions. Somebody says, we, we can never understand God. Who, he is not mysterious. So it says, the ways of the Lord are mysterious. The Lord does things in mysterious ways. He doesn't do things in mysterious ways. To be mysterious means that you are confusing. It means you cannot be understood. But the Bible says, He made His act known unto the children of Israel and His ways unto Moses. So He's not confusing. He has shown us, he's given us his word, that if we would study his word, he said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. He didn't say, my, my people are destroyed when I, when I feel like tempting them. The writer there said, God said that Satan moved God to destroy Job without cause. Because no man could see the cause. Humanly speaking, Job had nothing wrong. But when Job began to say, I want, I dare God. I want him to show up and show me where I did something wrong. I know my life. I've been perfect in every way. I want God to show up and then let him charge me with wrong. I don't know why I'm going through this. After God allowed him to die, then God showed up. When God showed up, he said, Job, can you tell me where darkness resides? He said, Job, I want you to tell me where does the wind come from? He's trying to tell Job something. He's trying to tell Job, you don't know everything. And God began to question Job. He said, who is this that speaks without knowledge? Who is this that speaks without revelation of wisdom? Who are you, Job? And Job fell and he said, why? Wow, you know, as God spoke from this side and turned over here, and God spoke from the other side, ha! And God was speaking from everywhere. And Job began, ah, my goodness, oh boy, where is he talking from? He was everywhere. And Job fell down. He said, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee. I have poor myself, I repent in dust and ashes. I'm so sorry, dear God. I thought I was somebody. I thought I knew something, but I repent. Why did he repent? Because when the perfect light of God shines, then you can really see. God said, you're talking without knowledge. There's a lot you don't know. I was judging you on the basis of your knowledge. When I said you were perfect, it was based on what you knew. There's so much more you don't know, Job. And some of that stuff that Job didn't know is what we have been given by the apostles in the New Testament. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Job was destroyed because he didn't have the revelation. He didn't know what Satan was like. The Bible says he's transformed. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. You can see that in 2 Corinthians, reading chapter 11 and, <clears throat> and in, in verse, um, let me give that to you, 14. In verse 14, you see that. He's transformed into an angel of light. When he begins to carry out his religious practice, you will think he knows everything. Now, I want us to serve God. Let us now be in the Spirit. Let us go into the presence of God. He's telling lies. You do not go into the presence of God. After you're born again, you're born in the presence of God. You live in the presence of God. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And he's spiritualizing. We come like as something you have done out. We don't go out and we don't come in. We are born in there. And by the Holy Ghost, we live in there. You understand? Your life is not for destruction. You have to understand who your real enemy is. And when you discover what God has given to you, you hold on to it. They don't tell you that you are barren. You cannot be barren. No, after you're born again, everything in your body is already touched by the power of the Holy Ghost. There's life in you. You cannot be a failure anymore. 
He says, all things work together for good to them that love God. All things, doesn't matter what you go through in your life, all things will turn out for your good. That means you cannot be disadvantaged. But when we don't understand this, we live a life of the victim. We are the victim. We don't know why we are going through this. Look at Job. He said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Now we can see the kind of man he was. He was living in fear and nobody knew. He greatly feared. Nobody knew. But he spoke boldly outside. But he was a righteous man. Your righteousness is not enough, brother. It will not stop the devil. Your holiness will not stop the devil. You have to understand that devil, he can show up anywhere. He can show up anytime. But you have to understand that with your lips, you can utter knowledge and stay him where he ought to be. Just because you've been going to church doesn't mean your business will succeed. Just because you've been studying the Bible doesn't mean everything's going to be all right. Are you hearing me? You have to have it in your mouth. You have to speak it out. Don't tell me that because you stay clean, that's why there's no disease in your body. You have to understand this. Oh, it's not coming from the water. It's not coming from the food. There's a devil out there that you have to be aware of and keep him where he belongs. Defensive Christianity will never help. Don't say, well, when the devil shows up, I don't know what to do. Don't wait for him to show up. Put him where he ought to be. Are you hearing me? Look at Job. For the thing, verse 25, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. He was afraid of losing what he had. He was afraid that one day all of these things will be gone. You look at that guy who's always looking out through the window. He's afraid of something. Uh, there's a shaking, there's a noise in the night. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> his heart is beating. You're letting the devil come. Are you hearing me? What are you afraid of? The one outside should be afraid of you. But when you become afraid, fear had to mix. Fear had to mix. Fear, fear opens the door to the devil. This man was greatly afraid. afraid. Now, let me tell you, that was what God saw. When Satan was with God in heaven and they were talking, it got to the time that God looked and saw that Job had broken the hedge. I'll show you how he broke it. Now the fear was not enough to break it. The fear was there. But I tell you, the Bible says, sin, it says, desire, lust, when it, got, it has conceived, bring it forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bring it forth death. Alright? Now, the same thing happens with fear. As you nurse it, you nurture your fear. It grows, it grows, it grows until you begin to talk fear. Until people can begin to find fear in your voice, in your words. Until you begin to act fear. Fear grows. It grows up like a giant until it binds you. And everybody can now tell you're really living in fear. Look at the next verse. Look at what Job said. He said, verse 26, I was not in safety. Is that true or false? It's false because there was a hedge about Job. Job said he was not safe. Neither had I rest. Neither was I quiet. He said, I was not safe. I had no rest. I was always troubled. And I didn't keep quiet about it. I always told everybody, watch out. I don't know what might happen to me. Uh, if anything happens to me, uh, please watch out. If any he always voiced his fear. He said, I was not quiet about it. I told everybody. The man was talking his fears. I don't know what is happening in my body. I, it looks like I'm losing weight. I don't understand. I'm losing weight. I was 75, now I'm 68. I don't know what is happening. Maybe I ate something. I don't understand. If I die, please bury me here. If I die, uh, give the land in such a place to that man. If I, look at what you're going through. You are, you know what you're doing? You're cutting out your life with your tongue. And the day you die, nobody would know what actually happened. He said, but that man was such a good man. Huh? Huh? How can good people just die like, huh? 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 Hmm. Do you know why wicked people live long? Have you noticed that some wicked people live long? Can I tell you why? Wicked tyrants live long. 
dictators live long. You know why? Their mouth. They've come to that point in their life, they're not afraid of anybody, they don't talk fear. They talk as though the whole world is theirs. They forget that one day it will come to an end. But they have been able to prolong their days with their talking. They may not understand the principles. But brother, whether you believe in the law of gravity or not, if you jump up, you will come down. You see that? Learn to use your mouth. Learn to use it. With your mouth, you can order your life. James chapter 3 verse 6 tells us that your mouth can defile your body. And when it says defile, it's not talking about ceremonial uncleanness. It means that it can bring spots. It can bring wrong things into your life. When you discover that your body is beginning to have some disease, some infirmity, check your tongue. The Bible says the tongue can cause the body not to function rightly. Your tongue. I don't know how my heart is beating. This seems like it's beating faster and faster. Why don't you use your tongue to stabilize it? Use your tongue to stabilize in the name of Jesus. If you think it's not beating right, tell it to beat right in the name of Jesus. That is better than telling everybody what the devil is doing to you. You are testifying of the devil. I said, but if you don't tell somebody what you're going through, how will they be able to help you? Okay. Keep telling them. Keep telling them because I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, boy. Now, don't. Oh. What is it? What? Hmm. Okay, okay. Tell somebody, relax. Make sure you don't miss the services until, why until you shouldn't miss any service. But these series of teachings, as we get through with the, with the session, get the tapes, listen to them again and again and again. Faith is something you don't get all of it once. You have to listen again and again and again and again. Again and again until it motivates you and you start shouting. If you don't get to that point, if you don't get to that point when you're listening, don't stop. Just keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. First, we get on your legs. I'm telling you, you, you start going like this. You know? Until you go, mm. Before long, you will get up from your chair. The tape is still playing. Some of you, you are driving, you know, you are listening to the tape. The time will come when you start looking for where to park. I'm telling you. It's true. So it's not all that one of just listening and smiling. Uh uh. You, you listen and listen and listen and listen. You start looking for somewhere to park. You know? And don't be stupid. Don't park by the road. <laughs> Get into somewhere. You understand? Get into somewhere, some nice area. Park there. Lock the car. Come out. Don't stay inside the car. Be smart. Lock the car. Come out. You know why I said don't stay inside? Be wise as serpents and harmless as those. Okay. You just go, start talking in tongues. Leave home, brother. get Sasha. You know, talk in tongues. Release yourself in the Holy Ghost. Get these tapes. Listen to God's word. Stay your faith strong. It will energize you, rejuvenate you, strengthen you. Hallelujah. And then you see what happens to your job. You see how to talk about your business. The devil doesn't want you to say you're doing good. When you come, hey, how's your business? We're so, so. No, no, no. Not the kind of business that I'm involved with. Brother, tomorrow is Monday. You walk out and they ask you, how's business? They say, boy, we are all over the place. It's amazing what doors are open to us. You know what? The devil doesn't know everything. When you start testifying of God's goodness, the devil gets confused. He said, don't say it. Don't say it. Just say 
Well, we are managing. Everybody is struggling, so we are all struggling. We are hoping that this year will be better than last year. Uh, we don't know how things will turn out. That is the voice of Satan. Don't talk like that. Are you hearing me? I will show you. I will show it to you. In our next service, I'm going to show it to you. How you can overthrow yourself from where you belong. And how you can actually promote yourself. This year, you can tell that next year, this is where you will be. The only thing that God will do is to add to it. God can add to it. God can multiply it. But God will not reduce it. But if you don't determine where you're going to be next year, sit down there. You say, last year, you'll be the same forever. Look at me. Say, my life is moving forward. forward. Say, I'm in charge. Listen, listen. If you have a business here, if you have a business, or you work in a business that you are committed to, you have everything it takes. Everything. Everything. Everything it takes to be world class. I'm telling you. And it will not be by your sweat. Listen, grace is not, it, grace doesn't play fair. Listen, favor doesn't play fair. Favor doesn't look for who is qualified, brother. I may not be qualified to have what I have, but I have what I have. Hallelujah. You know, some guys believe they are more qualified than myself. I agree. It's true. But God looked at me. And He smiled at me. And He said, everyone get out of my way. I want that guy. Woo! I didn't think I was qualified. What do I do? The, he, the, the guy in charge, he just looked around and he said, I want someone from that part of the world. I want someone. And the Lord just looked around and he said, Hey, Chris, come here. And I said, Yes, sir. I said, Dear God, but I, but I, but I, I, I. He said, No buts, no ifs, follow me. I said, Yes, sir. That was it. Favor. Doesn't play fair. Can you understand it now? I am the favored of the Lord. I am so blessed. Nobody can change it. Because the one who favors me is bigger than everybody. He is the real biggie. Look around. No one can change him. He favors me. Think about it. Some people know better than yourself. But God has chosen you. (laughs) Hallelujah. You are favored. No, look at you, look at you. See the way you are. Look at you. No, look at you. You are favored. I said you are favored. I said you are favored. They may not think you are righteous enough to have it. They may not think you are knowledgeable enough to have it. They may not think you have enough experience to have it. But God has chosen to give it to you. Give him a shout, somebody! Stop it! 
Your way is already determined. Hear me. Your history has been written already. You are a success. You are a success. In the name of Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. All things are possible. All things are possible. What do you want to do with your business? All things are possible. What do you want to do with your school? All things are possible. What do you want to do with your job? All things are possible. In your family, all things are possible. In your body, all things are possible. In your finances, all things are possible. Give him a shout, somebody. Woo! Go man. Hallelujah. All things are possible. I'm on my way. All things are possible. I'm a success. All things are possible. Glory to God. I said we are moving on the global level. All things are possible. I refuse to be small. I said I refuse to be small. I am not small. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Can I tell you something? Several years ago, we were just about 150 members of the church. I walked into a bookstore and there I saw a book titled Pastoring Small Churches. I said to the guy who was with me, I said, I refuse to buy that book. They said there are good principles in it. I said, but I'm not a pastor of small churches. We were just 150. I said, I refuse to buy that book. I am not a pastor of a small church. Why? Look at it today. And we are all over the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Are you hearing me? One more thing. When they call for a conference of big time CEOs, go there. If they call for small business, Little business managers refuse to go. You are not a little business manager. I said you are not a little business manager. God is lifting you up. God is moving you forward. Are you hearing me? The lines are falling onto me in pleasant places. Yay! I have a goodly heritage. He has brought me into a large place. I am blessed. Glory to God! Oh, hallelujah! Glory! Thank you, Jesus. I know who I am. I have found my place in the Word of God. I have found my place. I know who I am. Hallelujah! I'm seated together with you in the heavenly realms. Are you hearing me? Oh, glory. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me, which energizes me, which anointed me. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Look, see, see as far as your eyes can see. It has been given unto you. As far as your eyes can see, it has been given unto you. See, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west, look all around you. As far as you can see, it's all yours. Hallelujah. It's all yours. My, oh my. Give him praise, will you? Give him praise.
And then one day I asked you a question Money and love you tell you love money It is more important than the faithfulness Don't be against me if I choose money Money with love who don't lie much money It kills my life, says my heart on fire It makes me hurt, baby, can't you see? Although I'm poor, I love you with heart they are so rich, but will they love you much? Like of money, sorry I don't need Drink your money, you are sad for love Nghèo tiền như anh, xin lỗi em không cần Giàu tiền như ai, em chấp nhận yêu xa